So welcome everybody to another uh, another Chew Stream. This is going to be great. Got my buddy Thierry LaFontaine on the stream. Hey, hey guys. Right on. And I got my assistant Massey on the stream too. Hey guys. Right on. Super enthusiastic Massey. <laughs> it's a Monday. <laughs> Perfect time to punch laziness in the face. All right. Okay, so um, this one comes from Brandon Gully. So Brandon asks, hey Bobby, enjoying the in-house workshop a lot? Awesome. T is an amazing teacher. Right on, good to hear. Last time you talked about how you get up at 4 a.m. So what time do you go to bed then? Everyone says hi also. Hello, hello <laughs> workshop uh, artists. Really good to hear from you guys and can't wait to see you guys next week. It's going to be great. Um, so yeah, I usually get up around 4.30, 5 o'clock. Today I got up uh, 4.55. No alarm. My alarm was set to 5 o'clock. Uh, yeah, this stuff happens. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, you know what's interesting to you is like uh, we're talking about um, through many recommendations from the uh, str from my own kind of people on Facebook, they're like, you gotta do this Wim Hof Wim Hof method thing. Um, it's kind of like meditation. It's kind of like training your cardio cardiovascular system and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so meditation, right? Doing meditation. I've been able to sleep way more before I had trouble sleeping past six hours for years, like 10 years. And I started to do meditation and this weekend I slept for like 13 hours. <laughs> what the heck? So now I'm like, how am I going to, did I just lose that ability to like wake up early now? Cause I just want to sleep all day. But uh, no, got up super early today. Um, so to answer your question, what time do I usually go to sleep? Yesterday I went to sleep uh, about 11 o'clock. So, you know, you try to get in that six hours of sleep. And uh, if you can, on the weekends or something, try to get in an afternoon nap and try to catch up on things. I think that's really healthy. Uh, of course, I do want to say that everybody's different. So, you know, T, how, how many hours of sleep do you need to sleep <coughs> to feel like rested? That's a great question, Bobby. You know, I have no idea. I never look at the time when I go to bed. <laughs> I, I notice something. Let's say I go to bed and I only have a few hours to sleep. Then I'm thinking, oh man, I'm going to be so tired when I get up. And then that's the last thought you think about before you go to bed. But now if I would have a few hours to sleep, I would think, I'm going to sleep so well and be so rested when I get up. And I find when I look at, if I count the hours I have to sleep, it actually affects my sleep. So I always make myself believe that I'm going to have so many hours that I'm going to be so rested. And I get up around like 6.30, 7 in the morning, but I never check the time I go to sleep. Sometimes it's probably 3, 4 in the morning. Sometime I just pass out at 11 midnight. Yeah, I can't trick my body like that. Like, I've done that before where I don't look at the clock and I just get up when I get up. And usually that makes me sleep a lot less. But, uh, yeah, I can't fool my body. My body will be like, you need rest. Ugh! And then, you know, <laughs> my back is just like, ah. <laughs> Well, you know, if I feel I need rest, then I, I'm just, like, I sleep a little more. But I feel, if I think every night before I go to bed, I'm going to be so rested and have so many hours of sleep, then I find it affects the way I sleep. Hmm. And sometimes I wake up even before my alarm, even if I have just a few hours of sleep. So it's like your your brain messes you up if you know... Yeah, time. you know, if you ever think like, if I tell you right now, it's like three and a half in the morning and you've been up for 20, 30 hours, then all of a sudden you'd be like, oh, I should feel tired and you're going to feel more tired. It's like Steven Silver 
Silver says, act uh, like you want to feel. Yeah, I don't know, man. I want to believe <laughs> it. I want to live that. You know, I've tried, but like, I don't know. My body will, it just doesn't get fooled as much, like as easily anymore. Um, you know, we've been experimenting with a lot of stuff. In all the years I knew you, we tried every hours to get up, to go to bed. Yeah, and you know what? Nowadays, uh, you know, what I like to concentrate on is routine. You know, to mm -hmm. get a nice, solid routine that I can do, like, you know, each day, that kind of thing. That's what I'm about now. Um, so anyways, let's go on to the next question because they're going to start coming in. Uh, KJP asks, hey, Bobby, I heard you guys uh, were going to do some subway sketching in Toronto. Is there a way that we could use the stream to ask people if they want to do it in Paris? What a great question. Um, I would love to do, you know, subway sketching in Paris. Uh, I'm going to be spending the month of May in Paris, so perhaps we can do that. But, uh, yeah, if anybody wants to join up in Paris, definitely there's other people that are interested as well. So, um, I'm not sure how to get the word out for you, but... Uh, I guess look up KJP uh, artist Paris. I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next question here. So um, the next question says, shoot, let me make sure I copy all these other questions here. But yeah, next Subway Sketch Group um, is happening this weekend, Sunday, first or this last Sunday, yesterday, uh, Masse was running it. How did it go, Masse? Oh, it was great. Um, there was uh, seven people in total, which is a pretty good number. So, yeah, we met up. We went on subway, went up and down. So it was like a total an hour and a half. Mm, but yeah, an hour and a half, two hours. But yeah, there's a lot of like people that came in, came out. Makes it, it easier to sketch, though, right? Yeah, definitely. Awesome. I'd love to see some later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you have any. No pressure. Yeah, no bunch. pressure. <laughs> Very cool. Well, uh, there you go. You know, part of having a group is just to take away that, uh, that awkwardness of staring at people and mm -hmm. drawing them. But as well, it kind of um, gives you kind of like this responsibility to join you know to meet the group again because yeah. you're you're going in a group right if you're just going by yourself and you go oh i don't want to go anymore then it's not a big deal yeah and of course you're the one running it now mm -hmm. you know one of three people running it now taking turns and stuff so then you have to go yeah pretty much <laughs> and you know what i found that that was the greatest thing about running the subway sketch group was knowing that i had to go yeah. what if just one person comes i don't want that one person to not you know have anyone yeah to have this bad experience and uh -huh. stuff we don't want that to happen so right on right on let's go on to the next question here so the next question let me see i just want to make sure i got all the questions okay so the next question says uh mark says do you take a day to do something not related to art at all my friends say i should take a day off but I feel guilty when I'm doing it. What's your opinion about it? Yes, I do take days off where I'm not doing art. It's a bit more rare just because I don't like to take a day away from art. Um, but at the same time, I do think about art every day. Every, 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 every day. So if your friends are like, hey, you're ignoring us, you're not being a good friend, then yeah, you know, if they're good friends, you should probably go out and hang out with them. But at the same time, you can stare at their face and go, how would I characterize you? How would I paint you? How would the light look if it was coming from the other side? And blah, 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 blah. Right? And they won't even know. Um, it's funny because, like, subway sketching, 
even when you're not sketching, you're totally staring at people, totally analyzing, totally thinking about them as a drawing. Same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And T, do you do any days where you're not doing any art? Well, where I'm not drawing or painting, yes. But a little bit similar to your answer, I think about it all the time. And I, I just stare at anything. I can stare at it at a window at anything and now I'm staring at my window mm -hmm. and it's like all diffuse lighting and I'm looking at how soft those shadows are and all the time I'm thinking about that stuff and sometimes you know if you feel guilty I do there's little things sometimes I do when I watch TV I just split a page into a bunch of like a grid and I just sketch little composition like just two tree value, something really simple. Or I sketch people's hand. Because when you watch TV, people move their hand all the time. So if you have a guilt problem with uh, doing something else than art, um, there's a bunch of cool little exercises like that you can do just as you watch TV. Yeah, so, it definitely is important though to get out of your house every once in yeah. a while. Like seriously, it is very important. You know, life, I... life is inspiring. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like I talk about working hard. I talk about, you know, really pushing yourself and all that stuff. But as well, like, you know, I this year I'm taking 16 trips, you know, not including the ones where I'm going to the workshop house. So you got to live your life. And in the end, all that living, all that living your life and stuff and traveling and meeting people and all that uh it really pays off it really pays off it's kind of like when you you know like uh steve jobs learned about typography and it's like what was that gonna have to do with computers and then all of a sudden you know uh apple fonts and apple are so amazing and blah 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 it comes from you know going outside of your your whatever it is that you're learning right uh by the way i just want to mention that um you know t you painted a cat last time so this time i'm painting and i decided i'm gonna paint a freaking cat too just because i don't know i liked your cat and i was like i want to do a cat as well so just in case you're wondering hey that kind of looks like bobby's painting it is um yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, I guess let's go on to the next question, if that's cool. Um, Thomas asks, My question is kind of a lame one for you, but I'm still in school studying 3D, and I want to be a concept artist, but I don't know where to start. 3D is good. You know, it is very good. And you know what? More and more concept art is going towards 3D, but uh, where do you start? Where do you... You got to learn you got to learn the software obviously that's going to be very important but the core 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 stuff is always in understanding the world around us understanding life you know understanding those fundamentals and what does fundamentals mean T maybe you can enlighten the uh, what does fundamental mean? Yeah, when, when everybody talks about, oh, strengthen your fundamentals. Oh, work on your fundamentals. What does that mean to you, T? Well, to me, it's um, basically how to... To me, art is a form of communication. So your fundam fundamentals, to me, it's like the alphabet, how to make... If you would compare drawing to writing, the fundamentals of writing is learning the alphabet, learning words, having vocabulary, and then learning how to make structure. And then to say interesting stuff, it's like poetry. So to me in art, the fundamentals is knowing how to communicate stuff clearly. So to me it's structure, uh, light and shadow, um, how to learn how to paint really simple form. I make my students paint white cubes, white sphere, bunch of white forms. And I feel when you're able to use line shapes 
forms, colors to express what you want to say, that's to me uh, the fundamentals. Then it goes to poetry, being able to say interesting stuff that interests people. Totally. And I, just a little addition to that, um, you know, fundamentals also means whatever it is that you want to do, there's fundamentals within that. So in other words, if you want to be a car designer, you need to know the fundamentals of car design. Now, what does that mean? That means, well, you got to know the guts, the general anatomy of the car, just like how mm -hmm. we would learn the anatomy of a person, you know, the chassis and the, the wheels and so on and so forth. Um, same with architecture, right? If you're, if you want to go into concept art as a environment artist, then you're going to need to learn about architecture and, you know, how does it work? The fundamentals of architecture. So think about the thing that you really want to specialize in and then look for the fundamentals within that. It's like learning the language. Yes. Learning the language. And, and also it's like you're learning uh, knowledge that has been passed down for, you know, generations and generations and generations. Like, look at all the knowledge that's been passed down through architecture, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, weapon design, for example. Uh, all sorts of things, right? Let's go on to the next question here. This one's coming from Teresa. I'm learning an... I'm learning a... Uh, academic drawing now but I want to learn digital drawing and painting too what do I need to learn and how to begin well um, if you don't know Photoshop at all right now what I would say is take an introductory class to uh, digital painting um, you can do this through schoolism you can do this through books you could do this through wherever but schoolism does have, uh, you know, that is our passion to teach art, to teach um, professional artists as well as beginners. You know, so we do have a class called Introduction to Digital Painting, which I think would be right up your alley. Uh, I also teach a class myself called uh, Digital Painting Techniques. So. The great thing about those classes is it doesn't go through every single option in Photoshop, which would take forever and, you know, half of the stuff you would never use. Um, it goes through the most important uh, functions and tools and things like that. But most importantly, it shows you how to actually use them, the different techniques and and uh, you know, doing the assignments helps you absorb those techniques and those methods and gets you familiar with the tools. Okay. And you know, um, what he's doing right now is part of doing digital painting. Because mm -hmm. knowing how to draw and paint and is like, that's the main part of it. Uh, digital or traditional is just the medium. And if you look at Paula Zane, Nathan folks, they all were doing traditional and then they jumped to digital and they were amazing. Well, that's the thing, right? It's like, if you know the fundamentals, the great thing and the important thing about the fundamentals that you know everybody always talks about is that it's totally transferable from, you know, oils to, you know, watercolor to digital to traditional to sculpture even. Mm-hmm. So he's already started his digital training in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so next question here. This one says, uh, this one comes from Calvin. Calvin says, have you, ever, have you guys ever uh, tried to exper experience the polyphasic sleep cycles or ever heard from other people doing it it really benefits at someone as something for our productivity um no i haven't uh calvin have you have you no. heard of that i never heard of that but I, i'll uh, google it yeah i like i like you know i do art because i love learning new stuff 
Yeah, yeah I don't want to be able to sleep even better than I'm sleeping right now. I would never get up. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I'm good at this point, but I'll definitely keep it in mind in the future. Because <laughs> literally, I was like, I was shocked. I was shocked. Like, I got up around 2 p.m. And I was like, what the <laughs> heck? Anyways. Okay. Back to the next question here. Because they're all just coming in. Uh, I'm just going to copy this. One. Okay. So the next question says, this one's from Mark. And Mark says, what's your opinion on non-figurative art? Some friends can't see um, Kandinsky and other, you know, artists like this as great artists, but I, si I simply love these artists and their approach to art. You know what? There is good stuff and there's bad stuff in every kind of art. Representative, non-representative, uh, you know, completely just abstract. You know, there's the good stuff and there's bad stuff. There's great figurative art as well. Um, so the good stuff is good, you know? I and the thing about it is um you know some people might think oh yeah like half of abstract art is total crap right it's total just hype and connections and politics and whatever else which might be very much true but you know do you think that concept art doesn't have the same stuff these you know artists that read a tutorial about do this filter and then that filter and then do color dodge and then you're, you're good right same thing same thing it's all fluff no substance um where some people might kind of argue that oh yeah this is good because this and this and this and yet they can't tell between a child's drawing and an adult's drawing um it's interesting it's an interesting question what do you think t yeah, I agree. Like, uh, you know, I think there's good and bad stuff everywhere. And, you know, fine art is a different game, and they have a certain taste for stuff. Illustration, concept art is totally different. And I think there's, like, amazing artists uh, in every of the films. And there's bad artists in all of them as well. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, there is a side of art where it's like it's easier to to just talk a bunch of bull you know because <laughs> there is a side of art where it's like you do the art whatever it might be and then you explain why it's art right and that's like that leaves a lot of opportunity for a lot of crap mm -hmm. and i think that's what kind of gets that kind of connotation around uh non-representative mm -hmm. parts well it's a different game you know it's a different market totally and you know when you know someone and they're super cool and they talk to you about what they do you like their stuff better it's political i'm telling you you know one time uh you know there there's the skill involved but there's for sure political stuff in the mix Okay, so it's not like all political, but there is a lot in there. Like um, when when I just graduated school uh, years and years and years ago, um, you know, I, I entered my film in some uh, children's film festivals, right? And mm -hmm. so I went to one of them. I went to a few of them, but I went to this particular one where... The girl that won, her film she did in a weekend. It was literally just, um, you know, she got those cocktail swords that you have in the drinks and uh, used those and uh, cut out a circle and put an H on it, and that was supposed to be Hamlet. And then other circles with other letters on it representing other people in Hamlet. That was it, you know? And she gave like a 10 minute short like recap of what hamlet is and she won the whole weekend she won all the awards and then you find out oh her grandfather is on the jury 
oh, she spent the whole, you know, four or five days of the whole entire festival schmoozing with the, uh, you know, with the right people. Now, whether or not she deserved that prize, um, it could be up for a debate, you know, and I felt like there were a lot of films, you know, not pointing at my film, I really didn't like my film, but I did feel like there were a lot of films that, you know, really deserved a good amount of attention that probably never got it. And her mm-hmm. film got a lot more attention than it probably, um, you know what I'm getting at. So political stuff, yeah, it's definitely in the mix big time. You know, like who bought your stuff? If you have a buyer that buys your original painting for X amount of dollars and this person's a known collector, a collector that has discovered certain artists, then all of a sudden your stuff shoots up in like a nice, really nice way. Mm-hmm. Same thing with art, right? To you, it's like uh, you do one thing good, you get that thing under your belt, and then all of a sudden, um, it makes a huge difference. Even though one person might be painting the exact same way as you, same level as you, because mm-hmm. you worked on such and such, all of a sudden you have an advantage, mm-hmm. or you're friends with such and such. <laughs> Um, let's go on to the next question. Sorry for taking so much of that time to answer that question, T. Um, no worries. It's interesting. Cool. Okay, cool. Uh, next question comes from Mark Burnett. Mark Burnett. Is that the producer of, like, Survivor? No, that's different, right? <laughs> well, obviously, it's a different Mark Burnett. Uh, welcome, Mark. So, how do you get over the feeling of being uh, in over your head? I'm diving into a four month animation project while self teaching animation as well. I'd love to hear your ideas. A great to do list will bring you back, will take away the stress, and really bring you back to center. Um, that is that my bad Mark Burnett you just corrected me Mark Burnett of Survivor is with a K yours is with a C (laughs) right on Um, so anyways I was just gonna say I totally lost my thought but one of you saying to do a to-do list yeah to-do list takes away all the stress helps with the planning helps with your scheduling helps you to do multiple things at once and uh do you have a to-do list t what's your method yeah and uh when i make a schedule when i work on a project i usually take project that terrifies me and that i find really challenging and that i i don't know i'm gonna do and i'm gonna have to really organize and get better as i'm doing the project to do it so i find planning is really important and I try to really plan my time. I think of all the steps I'm going to do and now I could save time and switch steps. It's a, it's a lot to me like when I used to do like drawing. Remember when we had to do full color like drawing in like 10 minutes? You can't be wasting any second. So mm-hmm. when I used to do that, uh, I used to think of every steps I would do, which steps I could combine together, if I could get rid of a step if I could switch a step for another step. And I find if you plan your stuff really well, you can be a lot more efficient with your time. Because working hard is one thing, but you can work hard and plan stuff really bad and waste a lot of time, but you can work hard in a really clever way and get a lot more done uh, with your time. So to me, it's planning which is uh, like you do, you say, making a to-do list. Yeah, you know what? Uh, Some tips to go even further uh, is that when you do your to-do list, if it's something that is going to take a really long time, put a time on it. So it's like, um, say you need to work on a painting. You don't just put work on my painting. You put in the time there. Because obviously mm-hmm. you're multitasking as well, uh, going by your question there. 
um, you're multitasking. So you would put uh, two hours painting. And the time that you put down, put down the minimal time that you want to spend on it. Okay, so if it's like it's a really busy day, just put half an hour. If you go over half an hour, that's totally fine. But just commit to yourself that you're going to be doing half an hour and give yourself goals that will be achievable. Hopefully, easily achievable. So that means like writing down micro tasks as well, which is something that I do frequently. You know, like um, you got this, You. I got to plan some giant uh, project. I might just think, okay, what's the exact next step? Okay, well, I don't know this. I don't know that. I should email so-and-so. That's my next step. And then that's it. I'll just do that and then move on. Right? And uh, constantly ask yourself, what is the next, what is the exact next step that I should be taking? That, that, that's cool advice. I do that more specifically when I paint stuff. I make my students do a lot of 30 minute studies. Mm hmm. And I find at first they panic and they, they're not used to be in that state. But when you have only 30 minutes to do something, you don't waste one second. So what I, I try to get them used to that feeling. And when I work on stuff, sometimes I know I'm going to have like two hours to work on something. But I work like I only have 30 minutes to do it. Sorry about that. So what I was saying is, I work like I always have 30 minutes to do something, mm. like even if it's two hours. <laughs> yeah, you know, something that really works well for me is um, I have, I've said this before, uh, but not for a while, I guess. I have a timer. I have a timer that's set for 20 minutes. Okay. So I'll turn it on. It starts going. And then I'll do stretches for the first minute. And then after that, I could do whatever I want, you know, yeah. until the timer goes off and I restart it and I stretch for that first minute again. Okay. So obviously, if you're not getting stuff done and it's almost time to stretch again, you're like, you're feeling bad because you really should be stretching because you're drawing so much, right? Mm -hmm. It really like gets you going, I, I find. It really makes you like, go, okay, the 20 minutes, they're going to be up soon. And right now I'm done stretching now I only have 19 minutes what am I gonna do in the 19 minutes stops you from getting up going to make coffee stops you from you know getting up and doing other things or searching on Facebook or whatever else uh, because you're so much more conscious of your time you want to know a funny trick to paint faster let's do it when I need to pee sometime I don't go pee because I feel when I need to pee, I do everything faster. <laughs> it's funny. You're either going to finish this painting or you're going to humiliate yourself in front of these uh, these you, artists. There. You know what's funny about that? I used to do the same when I was doing CrossFit competitions. If I pee, that I sounds work out like faster. totally not healthy. Well, it's being not like super like active gonna... and uh, needing to with a full bladder. I don't know. Well, it doesn't need to be full. Is that, you know, you ever notice you're doing something and then you need to pee and then you just like work faster because you need to finish that and then you go. I had a friend too, uh, he was a hockey player for junior and he told me he was doing the same thing because he skated faster. So that's, <laughs> that's my so funny, funny trick. Interesting. Try it. <laughs> don't, don't no, <laughs> I'm not going to try that one, T, but uh. I like it, you know, for you. <laughs> not for me. Sometimes you're like me. so into it, you kind of forget about going to the washroom. That happens to me sometimes. Yeah, yeah, like I don't want to go to the washroom yeah. because I want to keep painting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that happens a lot. That happens a lot. And then I'll be like, you know, I got my desk that can move up and down. Mm -hmm. So I'll like stand there and like go side to side for a bit, step in side to side. Uh not the best picture to put in people's heads. Okay, let's go on to the next question. So the next question says, um, this one is KG, KJP. About the London workshop, do you guys have some hotels to advise? Definitely email info at 
schoolism.com. Uh, they will be happy to give you suggestions. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know which hotel um, that we're staying at, but if you email info at schoolism, I'm sure people will be able to tell you which hotel we're staying at, and then you can stay at the same hotel, and that'd be really awesome. Which workshop is that? That one's London. London. So London is happening April 16th, 17th. It's going to be with Sam Nielsen, Nathan Faux, Carla Ortiz, Wesley Burt, Jeff Turley, and Christoph Latrette. And then the weekend after is going to be those guys in Berlin, April 23rd, 24th. Get on it. Get it or regret it. I'm telling you. What a great lineup. It's going to be killer. It's going to be killer. It's going to be six artists this time instead of, I think it was four or three last time. Um, hey, I'm telling you, you just go once, see how it is, and uh, you'll thank me for it because, like, I learn a ton every time I go. Mm. Um, I don't see how others wouldn't. Um, by the way, you know, other workshops that are happening is... The, f- the next one coming up is in March. So March 12th and 13th is going to be in Montreal. So great excuse to come and visit UT. And then it's going to be Florence in March 19th and Seattle April 7th and 8th. So a ton of uh, really great events. See which one's closest to you and I'll meet you there. Actually, I won't be at London and Berlin um, because I'm going to be in Paris but the rest of the schoolism people are going to be there as well as that whole lineup I was just telling you about. Let's go to the next uh, thing. Also, I want to give you a suggestion, KJP. Um, I don't know if you guys have Airbnb over there, but it's definitely a much cheaper option for lodging. Okay, so next question said this one's from Flavio. What's up, Flavio? Uh, former awesome in-house workshops uh, artist, amazing artist. Okay, so this question is for T. Yes. Do you have any plans on doing some personal art projects this year? I would love to see more art from you. I have this children's book that I'd like to do. That I kind of have a little story for it. So are you committing to that? <laughs> are you going to be putting out a children's book this year? <laughs> so, you know, that'd be a great challenge to commit to that right now. So, yeah. You don't have to. I'm just, I'm just busting your balls. <laughs> uh, let's go on to the next question. You could think about that one. So Mark Burnett asks, when is schoolism coming to New York City? I hope it will come you know towards the end of this year or next year i would love to go and uh, do a thing in new york city because i love new york it is so awesome to go there and uh, before we would go to the new york comic con all the time and uh, over the years more and more trips and all this stuff and so we haven't been back to new york in in quite a while so yeah, I would love to do that. No plans yet though. No plans yet. So see if you can get to any of the other workshops or something like that if you want to uh, meet up and see us. All right, so let's go to the next question from Teresa. So she says, I used a uh, painter digital, p- sorry. I used the painter digital technique in Photoshop and find myself spending so much time on cleanup uh, on my images towards the end. <laughs> is there any is there a workflow method to improve on? Is there a workflow method to improve? Well, you know what? There is kind of like a a skill to putting on a great finish to your work. Um. What I would say about that is, are you doodling more or are you learning more? You know, because to finish something, it's going to be quite easy when you're learning, you know, from somebody else. 
if you're just constantly just painting your own stuff and just struggling just doing your own stuff you won't get nearly as far right like if somebody learns something and wants to teach somebody else as long as they're a good teacher and as long as they can do that thing that they've been learning really well they'll be able to teach you in a fraction of the time so surround yourself with good mentors look at some uh, good videos if you can get them or, or books or or yeah do you have any advice on finishing your putting that finish onto your stuff T um, you know as when I need to do stuff really really finish I feel I spend a lot of time on the last 10 20 percent of the painting because you know sometimes for a cover for an illustration book it needs to be really polished so I feel I can do like most of it really fast and then the last 10 20 percent so I I'm, have that same uh, thing than the person that has the question as. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, next question is from Miguel. And uh, the question is, what happened to Alvin Lee's course on schoolism? So I was saying this last time, Alvin Lee, comic book artist extraordinaire, has, not, has uh, moved away from comics and works on League of Legends now at Riot Games. So... In doing so, uh, you know, he didn't really feel like the course represented what he does anymore and asked for it to be retired, which obviously I respect because I respect uh, Alvin very much. So we took it off. But hopefully he'll do a class with us in the future. And um, yeah, that would be great because Alvin Lee, killer. He's a killer. All right, let's go on to the next question. So the next question says, from Thomas, I'm still a student, but when I finish school, what should I do? I know that I should start training every day, but I'll need money to live and, uh, and to move to the US because Thomas is from Belgium. Um, you know, it's almost like I don't even want to give the advice because it's the same. Like, schoolism subscriptions are $12 a month. <laughs> you can't get any more value right now. Uh, you know, anywhere out there, you can't get that kind of value for that kind of price. And that's the whole entire purpose of uh, the schoolism subscriptions. You literally pay less per month than a lot of people pay for a dinner just once a month. Uh, that's the whole entire purpose is to make education completely affordable and not just any education but literally you know I'm scouring the world for the best education out there from the best artists out there so take advantage because it helps me be able to get even more people to you know share their knowledge that's taken them decades and decades to learn and teach all of us um, yeah, and I, I do apologize if that feels repetitive, but, uh, I can't, you know, honestly, I can't think of another uh, resource that is as affordable and as, uh, as valuable from such high level artists. I just can't. So schoolism subscriptions, heavily recommended. And uh, yeah, sorry, T. I'm taking up all this airtime. No, it, it's it's great advice. You know, this is this is where we learn, and yeah. this is our version of the perfect school. Right on. Well, and that's my like, goal. Is you know, like, it's not to build a great school. It's not to you know make a lot of money or things like that. These things happen as a result of having a goal to make something that will last the test of time, that people will say decades from now, or perhaps even over centuries from now, and just going way back when it was the birth of the internet, there was this school, and it's called schoolism, and all <laughs> was amazing, you know? Uh, that's my goal. Let's 
go on to the next one. And the next one says, um, next one is from Jose. Speaking of fundamentals, I've noticed over the years that perspective techniques being left out as a part of basics of learning. Why is such an important technique being left out? Because there's software and things like that that will do the perspective for you. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, it's funny like that because it is still very important. You don't want things to look stiff. And the best way to do it is to know how to do this perspective uh, yourself and perhaps using tools to get it done. But if you don't know how to do perspective yourself, a lot of times the perspective will look very forced, right, T? Like yeah. uh, you'll get these images that look almost fish islands or something. Mm -hmm. And you know, perspective is something you can grab a book and learn from. You don't really, you know, there's, you don't need it as much as a tutor or a teacher as much as different technique because everyone paints their own way. And even if you learn the same technique from two different artists, they're going to be doing it differently. And perspective, I feel, is something you can grab a book and uh, learn it from. Yeah, definitely. And I, if I could, I feel like I'm saying definitely a lot this <laughs> podcast. You definitely are. I I absolutely am. Okay, <laughs> time to put in a couple absolutely. Um, Scott Robertson, there you go. That's yeah, a really yeah. great. Uh, you know, really, he made a really great book. I think it's just called How to Draw or something yeah, like that. I have that book. It's phenomenal. It's great. You know, I'm not associated with that, so I don't promote schoolism all the time. It's really, I just try to promote the things that I really, really believe in. And that's another one that's just like full of value. And by the way, I just wanted to mention that uh, Scott Robertson's book, That's Full of Value, would actually get you months on schoolism subscriptions <laughs> for oh, yeah? the same value, right? Because his book is like, I don't even know how much it is, $30 or something like that. Yeah. That's like over two months of schoolism subscriptions, just to put things in perspective. <laughs> All right, let's go. But yeah, Scott Robertson, love his stuff, highly recommended. Uh, let's go on to the next question. Do I still like Shark Tank? This one's coming from Mark. Uh, yeah, love Shark Tank. I love to see how people pitch stuff. I love to see their products. Um. Yeah, I think that's a great show. Do you watch Shark Tank, T? No. All right, right on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry if you're episode with you. Oh, okay, cool. So next question is uh, Kelvin. Kelvin asks, are you guys gonna, are you guys planning to do a comic book class uh, at Schoolism someday? I would love to do a comic book class on Schoolism someday. Uh, just gotta find the right teacher with, you know, uh, a good amount of time. <clears throat> has to be a great artist and has to be a great teacher and has to have time which is like kind of those three things kind of battle each other all the time right you're doing art so you can't teach as much or you you know you're really successful so that means you have no time it's not the easiest thing in the world to find great um, teachers for schoolism but that is my mission so don't you worry who knows <laughs> it's gonna happen Maya hello Maya Maya asks to T bear she asks you um, would you mind sharing one of your more favorite moments from the in-house workshop oh, I would wow. love to hear that too uh, hear a good story that's a that's a crazy question <laughs> there's so many really really cool moments and every workshop is totally different and there's so many cool moments mm. um to choose one and say i was the best moment will be just really okay. hard let's what? not put you into that situation but instead okay. let's just say what was a really cool moment what was a really cool kind of story uh first one off the top of your head that happened at the workshop house hmm there's so many stuff you gotta uh, just say the first one. 
You know, let me choose more of a recurring moment. I like the Friday nights. Because on the Friday nights, we all... I cook for my students. I love cooking. So they work hard all week. On Friday night, I cook for them. Um, you know, every group is different. Sometimes uh, we we drink. We have a glass of wine. Sometimes we drink a lot. Sometimes we don't drink at all. We play games, watch movies. Right now we're playing uh, Exploding Kitten. I don't know if you guys ever played that, but it's an awesome game. We're playing Ghost Blitz. We have Munchkin as well. I love the Friday nights. They're all different. Um, you don't got like one where it's like this one guy, he got so smashed, he started painting himself and painting, you know, ran out into the lake. Like not like like an actual story? Um, maybe give me a minute and okay. I'll think about it. Let's have T think about it. If you get, you know, a good story, let me know. Uh, next one is from Brandon. Yeah, you know what? Most of the stories, I can think of some stories, but there's stories that we can't really say. <laughs> what happens at the workshop stays the Exactly. <laughs> what happens at the house stays in the house. So this is a question from Nikhil, who is at the house right now. Um, Nikhil asked, I notice you're drawing as you paint. Is this uh, your most common workflow? Or do you start with a sketch before you dive into painting? At a point, Nikhil, drawing becomes painting painting becomes drawing the lines start to blur uh, I do a little bit of everything you know sometimes it's a if it's if it's something that I need to have very accurate like for example I'm you know working on some stuff for League of Legends and it involves some mechanical things then I would draw out the mechanical stuff uh, just because it's hard surface, so putting it in perspective, putting it into some good structure, sound structure, is going to be very important. And that, that's a great kind of um, example of when I would actually draw the, the stuff out, it, like, detailed. This one, I consider it more very much sketching uh, as opposed to hardcore drawing. Hardcore drawing is, like, tight drawing where there's no um, room for interpretation okay next question says do you have any plans on to make a workshop around Southeast Asia region you know what I would love to go to uh, India I would love to go to India I just haven't really found the time to fit into the schedule uh, I would love to go to Mumbai, actually, and you know, kind of experience that. Um, no plans yet, but you never know. You never know. But yeah, not happening this year. So, we were in uh, Dubai just a couple months ago. It would have been great to uh, have if you caught that one. Um, Let's go on to the next question here. So when are you coming to Vegas? <laughs> not sure, not sure, but we had a great time in Vegas. Oh man, T, you missed that one, huh? Yeah, it, it looked like you guys had an amazing time. Okay, so some highlights, some stories, I guess just some highlights, okay? <laughs> uh, John Whatever Cleese was there. <laughs> you know, John Cleese from, uh, you know, he was Q on uh, James Bond, he was there, and of course Mon Monty Python's, uh, the creator of DeviantArt was there. I got a story for you. Okay, I got a story for you. So I'm talking to the creator of DeviantArt, right? And I ask him, I'm like, he's a young guy. So I ask him, say we were to go back into time, and I was to, we were to bring the 16 year old version of you here and show him everything that ha you've accomplished and show him everything that you've done with DeviantArt and all this stuff. What do you think that person would say? You know, now that this this man is like a multi multi millionaire and all this stuff, all this success. 
so I asked him and he said well yeah hmm 16 year old version of me I think he'd probably just say okay good yeah I was, I was thinking that this would happen <laughs> and then I didn't really understand why right and then I read into it and all this stuff and it was like when he was 16 years old he got an offer for a million dollars to buy his uh, his site for um, you know those Winamp skins back back in the day there was Winamp right everybody used uh -huh. Winamp to listen to stuff and then you can change the skin on your player to be a different design all these different cool designs well you probably got that from his site when he was 16 so he got an offer million dollars and he didn't take it wow. how's that for a story <laughs> that's yeah. a great story and then on top of that uh, the weekend was also filled with um, go-go dancers in bathtubs <laughs> taking baths money falling from the ceiling uh, you know it was a good time it was a memorable, awesome time. Was this a workshop? This was a workshop. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so that's the best thing about these workshops is like you're there, you know. So the workshop happens, but it doesn't happen all day, all night. Yeah. The stuff that happens afterwards and the people, you know, that hang around afterwards is as fun as mm -hmm. the actual workshop. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so let's go on to the next question here. Bobby, if yes. I can... Uh cut in there oh yeah yeah i think i found my answer okay okay workshop story well one of the, my favorite time at the workshop was when uh, tom came tom, tom Flurdy. Flurdy. yeah he's a oil painter he's got a class two class actually on schoolism and uh, he came to be the guest artist at the workshop and um um we were Something really amazing that happened is that he does mainly caricature, but um, I, I wanted to get more into landscape painting, and uh, I always look for uh, tons of, you know, I went, I took Nathan Folk's workshop before he was do, doing the schoolism stuff in LA, so often I look at workshop I'd like to do with artists I'd like to learn from. And when Tom came, he just had taken a class with an artist that I wanted to take a class with. And um, here at the Imagine House, the landscape are amazing. Every day I go out in a car, in a truck. That is true. Outside, that is true. It's beautiful. And I've seen hundreds of beautiful landscape, totally different. So when I pick up Tom at the airport, we were looking at the landscape and talk about it. And um, don't be on the road walking when I drive because I'm just looking at the landscape. <laughs> and um, that with makes Tom, me feel safe. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom was taking walks uh, when he was here, and he was like, "I watch for you because I know you're looking at the landscape when you drive." <laughs> but anyway, with Tom, um, we were just looking how beautiful that landscape were. And he was like just learning landscape painting, which I had no idea he was. And then um, he wanted to paint outside. And I was like, you know what? I got a bunch of easel. Let's put them in the back of the pickup truck. We'll put the workshop student in the truck. And we just drove in um, the fields until we saw some beautiful barn or a tractor or something. We just stopped on the middle oh. of the road. For the, what do you mean? You, you went off-roading? Yeah, we went. We see something cool. We just turn in the field. <laughs> wow. But off-road, there was a lot of mosquitoes, and they were hardcore. They were following the truck after. <laughs> wow. But we just found a spot in a field. We unload easel, oil paint, acrylic paint, the students... And then we just drew and paint uh, in the field the Saturday and the Sunday. And it was like really memorable moment. You just, it's just like, let's do it. Let's just put the easel in the truck and find a spot. It was totally spontaneous, not planned. So that was a really, really cool thing. But you know, every guest I get here are amazing and it's always an amazing experience. 
Yeah, and you know what? When I go next week, yes, I'll make a I'll make a video. I'll make a video of the experience, then everybody can see like a bit more of like, oh, okay, because you know what? Like that was a cool story, and yet it to me, anyways, you know, it's there's so many other crazy awesome stories that it's just like we we just can't tell mm -hmm. online yeah. um yeah so hopefully we can capture some of those moments you know yeah. uh next week when when k and i and missay come and justin goby fields is coming that's gonna be yeah. killer let's go on to the next question because uh there's a whole bunch of questions we're running out of time let's try to burn through these ones uh Next question is from Monica, and she says, I would like to hear what T has to say about Dice and Robert's course, what he learned from them, how he improved doing the course, and what he generally took from learning from other professionals. That's a great question. <coughs> Dice and Robert's course is amazing. Um, I think Dice and Robert are geniuses. Um, the way they paint stuff with the overcast lighting, with the ambient light, is unbelievable. And, you know, they do stuff for, uh, they, they were doing the uh, color keys for Pixar, and the way they do the, that kind of lighting, um, the light doesn't affect the color. You see the local colors the best. And when they give that to the people that do the 3D and stuff like that, and the texture and stuff, they can see the real color and it can look exactly the way they design it. So they're like both super nice guys. They're super brilliant. Their technique is unbelievable. I learned so much in their class. Um, they were doing stuff totally different than what I used to do. And like we were saying uh, last week, uh, when you learn from someone, you got to be open-minded. You got to uh, trust them. Just do, I do whatever they tell me to do. And uh, their technique was great. I learned so much in their class. What, what did you learn? Like, what are some of the things that you learned specifically? Um, <laughs> like that you got better at? Yes, there's, I don't know if that may be a little complex, but you know, people say uh, warm light, cool shadows, right? Everyone heard talk about that. Yeah. And often outside, um, the sky is lighting everything. So yeah. the sky is a big blue plane on top of everything. Mm -hmm. So when stuff is in the shadow, the top part of everything is gonna be cooler because of the sky but one thing I, re, that really blows my mind about their class is that i used to do everything in the shadow cool before but from their class and it's a mix of their class and the schoolism live workshop that when i ask them questions that's the cool thing with a class you can ask them a bunch of questions but what i that blew my mind is that even though the top of stuff in the shadows is cool, the bottom of stuff in the cool shadows is actually warm. Or it feels warmer because the top looks cool. Relative to the top, it's warm. Yeah. And that's something that I always felt my shadows were plain. And if you look like at... Like they the... look kind of funny, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Then, if you look at it, you can look at their painting from Monster <clears throat> University... And you can see that the bottom plane facing down in their shadow is actually a little warmer compared to the top. And that's, you know, warm light, cool shadows. But in the cool shadow, the top is of object is cool and the bottom is warm. And that just, this is something like a pearl. And to me, I try at least once a month to learn a pearl, to learn something that just blows my mind. And there was tons of stuff like that in Robert and Dice class. I totally recommend it. Um, it's a great, great class. I learned so much. And uh, I was thinking of redoing their class with the subscription. But this time, uh, do it with acrylic or oil painting instead of digital. Mm, that's cool. Uh, yeah, I'm actually, I'm doing his class, their class right now. Like, 
I did their class, I watched the videos, but I didn't do the assignments yet. So now I'm doing the assignments and um, just to tell you what I've learned from it, you know, I, I'm doing some work for uh, League of Legends right now and I was doing something, painting something that was very complex. There's multiple light sources, multiple materials, uh, you know, and one of the light sources is actually coming from the object itself and all this stuff. And so I used Dice's method, Dice and Robert's method of just doing overcast lighting first and then started to add in the light sources and it turned out really well. Mm. Um, it's so, that's, so clever, huh? Yeah, and the coolest thing is, and why I do feel like they are totally brilliant, just genius level artists, is that they're the ones that created that whole entire pipeline, from my understanding anyways, of how to do color keys in that way, mm -hmm. uh, which really changed things in you know of like how people actually make animated movies now yeah that's what's so incredible true um pushing Innovators. the envelope yeah so let's go on to the next question this one comes from cody cody says i still struggle with color and using the right choices which class would you recommend to get a better better understanding of color nathan fox right on Okay, that one's easy. <laughs> so designing with light and color with Nathan Fox. Uh, that one's for Cody. And then the next question says, um, Doug Brown asks, uh, would you recommend a grayscale value first, then color? I tend to go monochromatic first just so I can see what the hell I'm doing. Um, what do you do, T? Same. Well, you know, I learned from you. And um, I feel uh, your workflow for when you do stuff for movies and stuff to do monochromatic first is great. And that's what I teach my students as well. And same when I do uh, acrylic paintings, I, I do kind of the work uh, Dutch Flemish technique and that's uh, monochromatic as, as well first. And I heard that Bougro was doing that as well. Yes, I, you know, it's the way that I do grayscale it's very much the same I, I, way I do acrylic paintings. I would do an underpainting first. Yeah. It's just that when I uh, work with real paint, then I'm using burnt umber, which is not grayscale, right? Yeah, but monochromatic. But it, yeah, exactly. You just deal with values. Exactly. Um, next question here says, this one is from Crystal. So... Crystal asks, uh, I was wondering if there's any tips for drawing intricate details on a large scale, such as a library. Look at it from far away. <laughs> you know, because having a really detailed image doesn't mean that you have to detail the heck out of it. It just means uh, that it feels detailed. So, it's like leaf on a tree. You think about how does a bunch of leaf look together? How does a bunch of books a bookshelf look together, right? You paint great trees, Bobby. When you paint tree, you don't paint every single leaf. I, I don't have to? When you paint trees... <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't paint every leaf. Um, yeah, like what T's saying. You gotta... The problem is that you know too much about what a library is. You uh -huh. gotta kind of look at it like um, like you're an alien you know how do you make it feel like a library you don't have to do every little detail just because you know what's there right Take you a have bit to of a, as a texture yes so it yes. has to be like suggestive right suggestive perfect thank mm -hmm. you missy um let's go on to the next question here so next question comes from felipe i just started out drawing what would you recommend or would you recommend life drawing would you recommend anything else? Life drawing? Yes, definitely. Uh, and of course, if you're going to do life drawing, you should start to study anatomy. And the way that you would study anatomy a lot of times is you look at diagrams, okay? And you copy the heck out of diagrams, look in the mirror, try to figure out where all that stuff goes in yourself. And uh, 
you know, draw life drawing, draw, you know, uh, nude figure drawing is great to analyze the body and all that stuff. But on top of that, something that really helped me before was taking photographs, right? And you put that photograph down and you start drawing the same photograph, the same pose, except uh, with no skin, all anatomy. Right, so you're taking some pose of some person jumping in the air or whatever, and then you start drawing in all the muscles. Which one should be tense? Which one should be relaxed? Which one should be here? Which one should insert there? And so on and so forth. I thought that was really good. And you know, you know, a funny thing, Bobby and I met at extra life drawing class. Yes, yes, we did. <laughs> and I was super annoying. Uh, I think it was just more like I was a different person back then, you know, I, I was just on my own thing and I was very militant about my own career and making it right. I was very paranoid and worried, I think. And me, I was just, I need to learn from that guy. Yes. I so, don't care that he look annoyed by me. Yes. Still gonna ask him. Well, you know what? That is really, that is why we've been friends for so long and why we can work together and why uh in that very very beginning when you were a beginner that's why i was like yeah i'll i'll tutor him even though i wasn't tutoring anybody else mm -hmm. i would tutor you because you know you were hungry not only that but you faced difficulties you faced rejection even and you still kept coming and to kind of pass that to Massey a bit of how she ended up in Imaginism. Yeah, you she know, annoyed you until you said yes. <laughs> actually, she she wasn't uh, she wasn't annoying at all. Um, so that wasn't the key for you, T. <laughs> the key was definitely just staying positive and still coming, right? So uh, Massey was recommended by somebody here at the studio. He said, oh, there's this great artist. Uh, they must say and blah 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 and then we had an interview we did the interview she wrote this very nice cover letter with her portfolio we liked it we had the interview we liked that too but it wasn't the right time and uh so we had to turn her down which makes me feel sad just thinking about it <laughs> but then like i think like three weeks later we we're yeah. at the toronto comic-con mm -hmm. the fan expo yeah and uh, I was wandering around, checking out the stuff, and I see Masse. And then I say hi. And she has the biggest smile on her face, and she says hi right back. You know, it's just like, even though we couldn't take her in, she was just as cheerful as ever, super positive, and her stuff is great, you know? Um, so at that moment, that's when I was like, yeah, we need to bring her in, no matter Aww. if we have work or not. <laughs> So there you go. There's a few good stories yeah, uh, this it's a session. Good story. I was actually surprised when you came to my booth. Yeah. I was like, oh, it's Bobby. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you know, I hope she doesn't hate me. I was oh, just no. coming over. I was and happy stuff. that you even like came to visit my booth. That's that's why I am reluctant to take interns now. You know that because if I'm gonna take interns, then that means you know going through Sheridan and stuff. Mm -hmm. There would be a posting. And then everybody would sign up. And then I would have to reject all these people. Uh, and I'm sure it's not a good feeling. I don't like that. Yeah, it really stinks. You know, somebody that's nominated for Annie Award, Domishi, at uh, Pixar. Fantastic. Amazing yeah. artist. And she applied to be an intern at Imaginism Studios. And then when I looked at her art, both Kay and I were like, wow, this is amazing. This is so good. But... We were looking for painters at that time. Yeah. So we said no. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's like, oh, maybe she felt like, you know, like bad about that or what? I hope not. I don't think that she would. But, you know, maybe she might have been like, oh, why wouldn't they take me? Yeah. You know? And I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I don't like that feeling. So, anyways. Good luck to Domishi for her uh, Annie nomination. Huge shout out. That's yeah. awesome. So glad to see her uh, succeeding the way she is. Even though I don't really know her that well. Um, let's go on to the next question. 
so next question says if I join schoolism can you guys help me build an illustration portfolio what do you say T we'll each take a drawing and we'll fill out the portfolio for them <laughs> <laughs> but obviously this person saying can you help advise and, and teach to build a portfolio um, well definitely of course because when you join schoolism you would be watching lessons but also you would be doing assignments right and those assignments the result of them is artwork which then you you know lots of people put uh, their assignments in portfolios just like people's school assignments and things like that um, so yeah I've got some great great piece from schools and classes that the class I do with the feedback and a lot of these pieces on the imaginism website as a portfolio pieces now there you go that's awesome right on um, next one says uh, good ways to deal with inner anxiety of rushing things to finish do you have any good ways to deal with the inner anxiety of rushing things to finish even when you know it wrecks your work it's still hard not to want to finish it quickly um so yeah inner anxiety i think that really goes into kind of like i'm going to reshape this question a bit because really the question should kind of be like uh, how do you gauge how much you can do in X amount of time so you get a due date how do you know when you're overshooting you know or if you're able to do something comfortably and hopefully not undershooting what do you think T? hmm like a uh... One of my thing is speed and I always try to pay it fast. Um, but you know, I, like when you are trying, when you're under the gun, and I'm sure I put you under the gun a bunch of times. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, I, I do one, I, I do one of them, you know, if it's a bunch of characters, like for example, for a children's book, I would do one of them and figure out how long it takes me to do it. Uh, you know, it's hard to just guess. Yes. When I, I worked on a, on a movie before, and um, that's what I was doing. I was trying, I do one, uh, guess how much, like, not guess, but see how long it takes, and then try to, and you get faster, you know? Usually the first one takes uh, the longest, but you get faster and faster. But my, my trick is to do one of them and see how long it takes, and then try to extrapolate how much, I could do for for those people yeah and you know the thing is like a lot of times your client will try to rush you because they're trying to get as much out of you as possible um, but at the same time they don't want anything that's subpar yeah. so you have to I really feel like it's it's through just over time you get more and more familiar with what you're able to do and mm -hmm. how much time does it take to do something really nice? Um, and if you don't know, do one before you give them a time. Yes, yes. Uh, the other thing that you want to take into consideration is the amount of revisions that you might not even think that you're going to get, but you're still going to get, right? And to think about all that stuff, so overshoot. That's what I generally always do. I will try to give myself an extra day and uh, or two, you know, and just take one day to just constantly come back and look at the painting and just look at it because uh, that does a lot too. There's been many times where, you know, you finish something late at night, you're pooped, you're done, you, and then you just send it off. And then the next day you look at your painting and you're like, oh, I should have did this, I should have did that, I should have. Mm -hmm. It's very important to have that kind of second look on a clear slate, so to speak. Um, so you always know, Bobby, how long it will take you to do certain pieces for project. 
Uh, usually, usually yeah. I like ninety five percent of the time I know, and I'll be able to deliver because um. You know, like this cat, it's very loose. There's maybe like the only thing tight on this whole entire uh, sketch here is the bug. Really, mm -hmm. it has clean edges and stuff. <laughs> Everything else is blurry, but it's the same amount of finish, right? So I would feel comfortable handing this in. It's all about if you can kind of work the whole entire thing in a way where you're going over the whole entire thing all the time. Uh, that way, if you don't have as much time as you like, you could stop at any point and it'll still feel uh, mm. relatively complete. I feel when it's clear, then it does what it's supposed to do. You know what I mean? The yeah, goal sure. is to clearly communicate this character to the people. And if with every part, sometimes it's loose, but you can clearly see what's happening. You know what I mean? Yes, uh, the communication is clear, yeah. right? So case in point, you know, we were talking about this yesterday. You know, what do you do when you paint, when you're painting a whole pile of stuff, just like a million objects and you can only, you only have like 45 minutes, an hour to paint it, mm -hmm. right? You, you got to be able to kind of take the whole entire thing at once, paint the whole entire thing at once, and you don't need to detail everything out. You don't need to crisp in every edge. And sometimes, you sh a lot of times, you shouldn't crisp in every edge un unless that edge is exact and it's accurate, mm -hmm. right? Or else it makes the whole entire thing look loose in the end, even though it has this finished feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, but when you think in that way, then you're able to paint pretty much anything you want in as little or as much time as you want because uh, you know you're painting everything at once and anytime you know they tell you to stop it has a finished uh, feeling to it a complete fe feeling to it yeah sorry I keep going on with these answers no nah, it's good it's good <laughs> that's why we're here all right um, I just feel like I'm taking up all your airtime well, I enjoy these conversation we have together and I love having them live with a whole bunch of people too. Okay, cool. Um, let's try and finish off these questions. I think we have like just a, well, we have like maybe seven more. Um, <laughs> let's try bust through these, okay? So yeah. let's go on to Toby Art's question. With the free release of The Perfect Bait, does this hint a new book is in the works? So let me explain first The Perfect Bait. It's a book that I started writing as a student, finished writing a few years ago, I guess. Um, but now it's out of print. The books are sold out. And what's this book about? It's all the lessons, all the philosophies, all the thoughts that I was thinking about you know, from a student to when I was a professional to when I got to work with Tim Burton on Alice in Wonderland and all this stuff and Men in Black 3 um, and all the people that I got to meet along the way and their advice and their lessons that they told me I put into this book called The Perfect Bait. It's for artists and it's really uh, philosophies of uh, becoming a successful artist. So it's free to download now until the end of this month. And you can download it. I put a simple link, okay? Uh, Bit.do slash perfect bait will lead you to my Google Drive where I put it there. You can feel free to download it uh, up to January 31st. That's when, after that, it's going to get taken off. So spread it around if you like it uh, because I'm not looking for any emails. I'm not looking for nothing. I'm just happy that it's sold out and I'm happy that you know people like it and I'm happy that it's helping people. So if you want to help people, you can help me by downloading yourself and spreading it around. How great is that, right? Um, uh, next question is Mark asks, T, do you remember the Baby Zombies movie? 
Jeremiah is the man. It's like, that's not a... Oh, okay, I guess that is a question. Do you remember <laughs> the baby zombie movie? Oh, my God. Hmm. Yeah. We watched a movie the other day at a workshop. You know, sometimes you scroll to movie and you see something that looks, like, ridiculous, like Sharknado. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then you're like, ha, 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 let's watch it. No, I don't watch it. No? Huh? Oh, <laughs> if Sharknado. I see a dumb title, I just don't watch it. I barely watch the good titles. We watched this weird movie, and there was a bunch of baby zombie. It was so bad that it was fascinating. Oh, okay. You know what? I did... I, Yeah. I have seen something like that. Like, I saw something where it's like zombie... Beaver zombies or something like that. Yeah, zombie beavers. So zombie beavers. Zombie 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 beavers. You know what I'm talking too. about? Oh <laughs> man, it. you you must binge watch these things. <laughs> that is so like just an obscure, just random title, and you know it. So yeah, I saw a little bit of that. I just fast forwarded to see what the zombie beavers look like, and they yeah. look pretty bad. But it makes you curious, you know. It did. It did. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. This next question comes from Jesse. Jesse says, uh, Bobby, is it okay if we contact you for longer questions and advice? What would be the best way to reach you? Actually, the best way to reach me would be literally these streams. Um, otherwise, uh, at live, you know, live at a workshop or live at a convention, um, that is the best way because my emails get filtered uh i only get the important emails that i need to respond to you must get hundreds of emails that's the thing even the important ones man sometimes it's hard to you know uh, keep up you know we're doing 10 workshops this year we're, you know i have 16 trips all together um doing a gallery show for Alice through a looking glass when that comes out for Disney uh, doing you know this League of Legends thing doing just a bunch of stuff it's just nuts so I barely have time to do emails um, I try to actually uh, put all that time into these podcasts that's the whole entire uh, one of the big reasons of doing the podcast is or not the podcast these live streams is so that I could you know answer people's questions yeah i could spend the, some of my time to try to you know reach out to people and answer their questions and stuff like that and you know yeah so don't be afraid to ask a longer question i guess in the chat yeah uh maybe this person has a very personal question to ask <laughs> you know, sometimes that happens um so next question here is from mark and he asks hey bobby how can you balance being intense and idle and idle time uh some weekends i just want to sit down and watch box sets back to back but i know i have to but i know i have got goals and targets i'm close to yeah so how do you balance it well how I balance it right now is like on the weekends, I'll wake up really, really early and just go to the studio, right? Wake up 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, go to the studio, and then, uh, you know, when the rest of the world wakes up, just give me a call. I'll come right back. That's how I deal with it, you know? So I have, so I'm not just like at the studio all the time. Um... The next question here is, yeah, and box sets, man. Mark, Mark's everywhere. Watch out, buddy. You don't want to get sucked in. <laughs> okay, so next one, Chanzy or Chans, something like that. I've always loved Magic the Gathering card art, and one day I would like to be an illustrator. Uh, what books or classes would you recommend to be the best well to be an illustrator for magic the gathering definitely uh first one that comes to mind is gesture drawing with alex Wu, luis gonzalez because posing um 
Another one that is very, very important would be some sort of, or a couple, you know, painting courses because painting is like drawing uh, squared. You know, it's just so much beyond. Um, I guess Sam Nielsen's course would be really good. Dyson Roberts course would be really good. So Sam Nielsen, uh, Fundamentals of Lighting. Dyson Robert painting color and your light. Dig, your digital painting classes too. Oh, thank you so much, T. I don't, <laughs> I don't usually promote my own stuff, but uh, yeah, but digital you, painting techniques. That that one's a pretty good card one. for uh, magic and stuff like that. I have done cards. Uh, I haven't done them for magic. I've done Who them was for, that for? Uh, World of Warcraft. Yes, I remember that Easter little guy. You remember? Yes. And there's a fox one too, right? I did a few of them. I did a few of them. I, I like doing those uh, whenever I get the chance. I would love to do uh, a few more, you know, in the future. It's yeah, just I'm... finding the time. When he asked which class, I was thinking your class. Oh, bless your heart. Right on. <laughs> All right. So let's go on to the next class question but yeah pictorial composition is another really important one because uh, as far as I've seen I haven't seen really good composition classes uh, and Nathan has a brilliant composition class pictorial yeah. composition with Nathan Fowkes um, last two questions I'm just gonna try to burn through these okay so Eduardo says hi Bobby this is a question about schoolism are you planning are you planning on creating uh, an anatomy course uh, eventually? Well, there is the creature anatomy uh, course, which is anatomy squared, you know, because you're not just learning human anatomy, you're learning all sorts of creature anatomy and how it relates to the human anatomy because that's the first lesson is uh, doing human anatomy. Fantastic course, highly, highly recommended. It busts your butt, it's gonna be difficult. I kid you not, but after you get dragged through the mud by Terrell Whitlatch, you will come out glowing like a golden god of of anatomy. So that's the one I would highly recommend, and uh, I'm taking that one too. That's how important it is to me. So uh, Adrian asks, uh, do you have any suggestions with dealing with clients that ask for adjustments again and again? Yes, you say right off the bat, this is how much it's going to cost. It comes with three revisions. And any more than those cost you this much money. And then you reassure them and say, but don't worry, it's very rare that I get to three uh, revisions or higher because usually what we do is I will give you a whole bunch of little thumbnails in the beginning, you know, very short you know two minute little doodles and then from there I'll get your feedback and then we'll go to uh, you know nicely rendered sketch get you to prove that then we're going to I'm going to show you some colored sketches and just take you through the process so it's very much not going to be a surprise and that's why I stop it at three revisions because if you do need more than three revisions that's generally that's only when people don't know what they want if you say all that, you'll be in the clear. People can understand that. Um, and that's all the time we have today. So I want to thank all of our guests, all of our wonderful people that have been hanging out with us, asking all these great questions. And of course, I want to thank my lovely assistant, Masse. And most of all, I want to thank you, T, for hanging out and just being my friend. So thank you very much. You're very welcome, Bobby. Thanks to you to invite me to these. It's it's awesome. I have a lot of fun. Right on, right on. All right, take care, everybody, and have a great Monday. The wow moment is probably when you know you, you start and you meet everyone for the first time. The ability to connect with each other. When I came here to the worship, it was like a huge step for me. Like, okay, I'm getting my drive back. And there was a little period where I, I found myself like what I couldn't draw the way I used to, and I was a little lost. And then after the second week, there was a day 
when everything clicked and all the things that they were telling me kind of like made sense and in a minute I understood the whole thing and that was pretty like a role model. Like, okay, now I get it, now I can I can get all the stuff that they're you know, teaching me and I can apply it to what I've been doing for the last year. T is a very persistent teacher, he's very honest and I think that's what makes us grow because he's not afraid of showing what, what we're doing wrong and what we can do to improve. He's not trying to make us happy, he's trying to make us learn. So that makes all the difference for me. T has a very clear way of explaining things. When he gives us our feedback, it's just like, you kind of you think that you've done an okay job and then he just takes it to like a whole different level. That's just the main crazy thing because now I can take well on the Cintiq and three weeks ago I couldn't. I, I evolved so much since I came here. It's like a boot camp where I got all the tools I need. I think that that's the most incredible thing and we've been working like this for the whole month and I feel that I improved a lot. And so that was one of the reasons I really wanted to do the workshop. Be surrounded by art, be surrounded by other students. After this workshop and meeting other artists, you really get to open your mind to the different perspectives and the different minds and how big the world actually is. You know, someone's from Spain, someone's from Austria, Brazil, and then people in Canada. It's just crazy. This, this was the best experience I've had in education. It's like I went through college and I had to do a lot of classes that I wasn't interested in. I would do the things I was and then it's diluted in between different subjects. And, but this one, you live, you live the course, you wake up, you're in class, you're, the level of immersion is so intense that there is no way that you won't take, you, you won't learn a whole lot. It was extremely rewarding. It's definitely life-changing. I would definitely recommend this uh, workshop to anyone. I haven't been to any other school or class or anything like that where the teachers have this level. This is this is industry level. This is something that you don't get in any normal school in any way. So the fact that you are living with them and they're teaching you stuff day by day and they can comment on what you do, it's a big privilege. It's a big thing. It's not. You know, you don't you don't take it for granted. It's really amazing. I really suggest it. I'm the first Colombian here, <laughs> so I'm gonna just spread the word because it's really worth it. I love that experience. <laughs> Every artist should go through such an experience. Learn uh, meeting people and getting to know other techniques and going deep into art for like a whole month. It's it's awesome. 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 Awesome.